you either love them or you hate them. But you're never gonna fail growing them again because I'm gonna teach you exactly how to be successful growing eggplants. We all experience strife growing veggies. Even if you don't plan to grow eggplants, by watching this video, you'll be able to apply my problem-solving process to remedy other gardening issues. This is the story of how I achieved eggplant victory after years of failure. Before modern supply chains made fresh produce a year-round commodity, for much of the temperate world, eggplants were only available in late summer. It is natively a tropical plant, most likely from India, growing abundantly in Africa and Southeast Asia. As a short-lived tender perennial, it loves our hot summers. The main problem is that it takes at least four to five months from seed to harvest under ideal sunny conditions. So in places where shorter summers, it can be quite tricky to get things right. Stage one, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. For us in higher latitudes like Maryland, several factors must align, timing being the most important. If you have trouble getting eggplants to produce, I recommend choosing varieties with smaller fruit that produce more blooms and mature faster, like the Asian style eggplants. Since we treat them as annuals, we must start them from seed, ideally 8 to 10 weeks before the last frost. That means I start seeds using the plate germination method around the end of February. I drop seeds over moist tissue paper on a plate inside of an enclosure, kept at 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit to hasten germination. As soon as roots start poking through, I plant the sprouts in cups with potting soil, or in this case, soil blocks. You can never fully predict how soon a seed is going to sprout. It's good to provide them in an enclosed, humid space that's warm. The warmer you can get up to 80 degrees, the better. Making soil blocks seems to be the perfect solution, not using single-use plastic and raising seedlings. I've been pleasantly surprised at how effective soil blocks can be, as long as you keep them moist. At this stage, they need an abundance of light, so I keep them under grow lights 16 hours per day. This ensures faster and stouter growth. A sunny window is not enough for eggplant success. I place a pane of glass over the tray until the seedlings leaf out. Then I remove it to prevent mold. Then it's just a matter of waiting. Stage two, moving on up. As the roots and leaves start to grow, it is essential to give them space, potting them up if necessary. I can see that the eggplants, they're growing well. Roots are starting to poke out from the soil block. Ideally, they needed bigger soil blocks, but if the soil block is too big, it starts to crumble. Eggplant can only be planted out when nighttime temperatures stop dropping below 50 degrees. Otherwise, they stunt, decreasing the chances of a harvest. I'm gonna have to repot them. I don't want them stressing out. I don't like to use plastic, but if you're reusing things, it makes sense. I'll probably have to do this more than once until it gets to the size where it can actually go into the ground in the garden. Since spring over here is rather unpredictable, I keep potting them up into bigger containers until the weather stabilizes. This ensures I get strong seedlings ready to start flowering. Two months after starting them from seed, by the beginning of May, my pampered indoor eggplants were sporting beautiful broad leaves. As it turns out, I was not the only one that marveled at the verdant foliage. Menace number one, enemies within. I see a troubling sign in the eggplant. There's several aphids. I need to take care of this. I'm gonna spray some water to dislodge them. With mild indoor weather, pampered seedlings oozing sugary sap and no significant natural predators, an outbreak of aphids had covered the plantlets. I rarely have to deal with aphids outside, but in this environment, they threaten to suck these seedlings dry as their population exploded from nowhere. Because I see that some of the eggplants are already bigger, I want to put them outside. I'm not gonna put everything yet because it's still a little bit cold, so I wanna harden them off, but I'll do it in stages so I don't put all the eggs in one basket. With this problem solved, I was ready to move on to the next stage of growth. Stage three. It's the hard knock life. The world out there is harsh. To transition the seedlings from mild indoor conditions to the vagaries of outdoor weather, it is essential to slowly get them used to direct solar exposure, temperature fluctuations, and wind. By gradually letting them spend time outside, I harden them off by stressing them a bit each day without causing them to stunt. A week or two later, they are ready to graduate into real earth. Stage four, location, location, location. The weather has finally stabilized. We have a rather cold May, but I need to get them in the ground if I hope to get any harvest 
by late summer. Unlike animals, plants can't roam around to find food. Therefore, providing them the perfect spot that has enough sun, water, and nutrients for them to eat, so to speak, is essential. The biggest mistake you can make is to choose the wrong spot. It needs to be the sunniest spot you have. So I'm opening up this area here, which does get at least six hours of direct sun to grow some of the edibles. I also amended the soil with organic fertilizer to give the plants a leg up. Because the soil here is not quite as nice as the soil over there, I decided to put some amendments. So I have here composted leaves and some all-purpose organic fertilizer. Trying to move away from that, relying more on plants and green manures, what they're called, so that there is a more sustainable aspect to the gardening I'm doing. Menace number two, a specter is haunting the garden. And that specter is... I'm a little bit worried that the eggplants could be eaten by groundhogs because that has happened in the past in my previous garden. So we'll see, I'm not gonna put all of them over here unprotected. By far the most destructive force in my garden is the hungry groundhog. Nothing else is as demoralizing as having plants raised to the stump in a matter of seconds when the silent beast attacks. Generally, they don't attack plants of the nightshade family like tomatoes and peppers, but eggplants are the rare exception. On the off chance it decided to attack, I redundantly planted some eggplant starts inside my protected garden bed. While large herbivores mean sudden destruction, something much smaller is my true nemesis when growing eggplants, the reason for repeated failings. Tiny critters that mine the life force of my plants by chewing healthy leaves into lacework. Menace number three, battling the tiny big boss. Flea beetles are the biggest hurdle to growing eggplants successfully where I am. Every other menace to this point is but a drill. This is the true emergency for me. Even if I'm careful about the timing and give my plants an advantage with a head start, by the end of May, beginning of June, hordes of hungry dot-sized beetles emerge to skeletonize the leaves in a matter of days. They jump around at the slightest touch, hence their common name, flea beetles. That, combined with the sheer number, makes controlling them by hand practically impossible. It is important to know there are several different species of beetles that look similar but have slightly different habits. Some only eat plants in the brassica family like cabbage, kale, broccoli, radish, etc. while others attack nightshade plants like eggplants and potato. They usually find their appropriate food source through scent, so I had to seek creative ways to hinder their attack. My first line of defense looked promising. Confuse the enemy with scent camouflage. I think I have just stumbled upon a secret potion for eggplants. Plan A, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Unless it just smells like a rose and is actually an eggplant. One of the joys of summer is being able to go barefoot and that's why I devised this natural insect repellent. I decided to try it on the eggplants. So I tested it out yesterday by spraying it, not even too much, and immediately the flea beetles just ran. I am sure they don't like the smell and they haven't returned so far. It's just a matter of spraying it lightly. Soon enough, the flea beetles just flee. I decided to conscript a concoction of strong smelling herbs that I use as an insect repellent to confuse the flea beetles into abandoning the field. It's been a few days since I first sprayed the eggplants and the results have been very interesting because I saw a sharp decline in the first days but gradually, because I decided not to spray to see what happened, the numbers did come back, so it appears that it needs to be reapplied. So here's how I put together the mixture. Essential oils are the volatile substances plants exude that make them smell the way they do. It is possible that the alcohol in this formulation could kill the beetles, but I had reason to believe this was not the case. This time I decided to do two part water, one part alcohol. You will need a carrying oil. That's just some kind of oil that will have more quantity and serve as sort of a vehicle for the essential oils to be able to spread around farther and I suppose last longer. I'm using almond oil, but if you're only doing it as a plant spray, use maybe soybean oil or some kind of vegetable oil. You don't need too much anyways. I used about 30 to 60 drops each of lemongrass, rose geranium, citronella, and lavender essential oil. I have not tested other ones, but they might work. Do remember that not all plant essential oils are harmless to plants. In fact, lemon essential oil, lemonine, happens to be a very effective herbicide. So being able to test not only the specific essential oil you're using, but also the concentration you're applying it in, and maybe even the frequency, may be very important. 
being a more gentle, benign approach. The spray does work for at least a day or so, but to be successful at repelling the bugs, repeated applications are necessary. But due to its price, for me, this is neither a practical nor economical solution. I was also concerned that constantly subjecting the leaves to the spray could cause the plants to stunt. Disheartened after declaring mission accomplished too soon, I had to escalate strategies to protect my plants. I had to go a bit more medieval. Plan B, one if by land, two if by sea. If you want to control these pests manually, drowning them in some soapy water is your best bet. In the early morning hours, flea beetles are sluggish, so that's the time to act. Once the beetles fall into the water, they will start drowning and because there is soap in the water, it helps to kill them. And I can clearly see how much the plant has been set back by their attack when we compare the other plants around here, like the peppers, which are actually in the same family. Look at how much bigger they have gotten. The spray has helped, but because I haven't been able to spray every day as I should, the effect has been less than ideal. I just prefer not to spray and do whatever I can to try to control it manually or through harboring natural predators so that the insect populations are low. I don't mind a little bit of insect damage here and there. It's just when it becomes out of balance, that's when it really creates a problem. The other thing is that, at least in my past experience, flea beetles would go away after a few first weeks, and after that the plant would rebound. While this method can help reduce their population, it must be repeated very frequently. The problem is, we don't know the overall size of the population in an area. These insects usually feed on other native plants as well, so doing this where they naturally abound is akin to dropping a bucket of water in a forest fire. For that reason, I had to try a physical barrier to protect the plants. Plant C Love recognizes no barriers. Beetles do. The best way to protect plants from insects and spare their life is to use a physical barrier, like floating row covers. This practical solution had been in the back burner in my mind, but I'd rather not immediately jump to it because it increases plastic pollution, which ultimately harms us all. After some reluctance, I decided to test the waters by using some fabric remnants I had laying around, sewing a bag to enclose the plants in. The results were mixed. Oh, well, that's awesome. Finally, I think I'm getting towards a more practical solution, and that's really row covers. I see no flea beetles. There are a few aphids, I think, because some ants are trying to farm them, so that's not good, but there's less damage. So even though my spray kind of worked for a while, I think this is a much better solution. A month later, the plant was showing its cracks. The protected environment in the bags caused a defeated foe to make a comeback with the help of a co-conspirator. Time was also starting to run out. My latest attempt has worked against the flea beetles, however, they're absolutely infected by aphids precisely because the ladybugs, which do inhabit the garden, I've seen many of them, just can't access them because of the cloth. The ants are the ones that bring the aphids so, this means I have a real problem. With the soul stunted fruit as a sarcastic participation trophy, I started to rethink strategies. I was still in the bargaining stage of grief when a false sign of hope formed as a mirage. The best laid plans. These eggplants, which I thought were completely dead, are putting out new leaves. There aren't any bug holes in them, so perhaps the beetles are gone. This is a normal part of the flea beetle life cycle. They eventually die out and the plants rebound, but September is just too late to make up for the lost time, especially as daylight diminishes in fewer. In my old cottage garden, I used to bank on this second wind, since beetle populations there seem naturally depressed, but here I could not count on that. With the arrival of winter, I recalculated and shifted strategies. I had to get things right this coming year, so I re-employed what had worked and corrected shortcomings. I started my seedlings indoors four weeks earlier at the end of January instead of February, having them hardened off and ready to go into the ground by mid-April instead of mid-May. This time I had to make a concession, using synthetic row covers, to control the climate and protect against bugs. A hungry rabbit had eaten two of my tender eggplant starts that were hardening off. I luckily caught it in time, still I was confident that they would bounce back inside the protected enclosure I was putting up. I'm gonna plant them out at this time because there is a balance between having it too early where it stunts eggplants because they love warmth and also waiting too long for then the flea beetles to attack. But that's why I'm using the row covers. Plan D, put up the big tent. 
Hard frosts were less likely to occur, but not impossible, so I chose the sunniest spot in the property, the front south-facing slope, and planted my seedlings as before, giving them a helping of organic fertilizer and ample grass clippings as mulch, this time protecting them with a wire mesh hoop covered with agricultural row covers. To keep temperatures favorable for the eggplants, I employed some recycled water containers to serve as heat sinks, absorbing excess heat during the day and releasing it at night. This temperature moderating effect of water is noticed in coastal areas and bays that have overall milder weather when compared to interior areas. By the beginning of May, flea beetles awakened with the rising temperatures as the eggplants grew lush in their protected cloisters. The bugs took up residence munching on the neighboring potato plants. I knew that as soon as they could breach that thin barrier, I would have a repeat of last year, so I had to take more extreme measures. Plan E, walking on eggshells. I'm gonna be trying diatomaceous earth to control the flea beetles. They are already attacking the potatoes that are planted on the side of the eggplants. By killing off the adults, there is less of a cycle to continue. There are two ways to organically interrupt the life cycle of flea beetles and decrease population pressure. They use a BT spray for their underground larval state with varying success and at the risk of killing beneficial ground beetles or diatomaceous earth for the adults. Since I was dealing with adults, I had to use the latter. Diatomaceous earth is composed of nothing more than microscopically sharp silica-rich shells of ancient diatoms, single-celled algae. They are harmless to larger animals, but lethal to insects, since these sharp shells abrade the exoskeleton of insects, causing them to dehydrate if they come in contact with the dusty powder. You must apply it as a light coating over the leaves, being careful not to breathe the dust. Ideally, use a respirator to do this, since you don't want this getting into your lungs. It is otherwise non-toxic, but rain will wash it away, so reapply it whenever it rains. All quiet on the western front. Back in my mother's cottage garden, I had planted a set of eggplants as an experiment. I remember this garden which flourished with all sorts of beneficial insects due to years of cultivation and tons of flowers and habitat used to experience less pest pressure with eggplants. I noticed something peculiar. The eggplant I planted in the ground showed some damage from flea beetles. I had dusted its leaves with diatomaceous earth, but for another plant that I had placed on a high pot, I could see no signs of damage. It seemed as if flea beetles attack eggplants close to the ground first, missing the ones planted in pots higher up. This could mean that planting them in containers far from the ground could result in almost no pest pressure without adding any kind of pesticide, organic or otherwise. But the key to success may lay precisely in placing a decoy plant close to the ground, somewhat near the other plants to lure the first wave of beetles, covering it with diatomaceous earth to control the adult beetles. By doing this, no second wave of beetles materialize. Of course, this garden never had as much of a problem with these insects as my new one, but this was an alternative solution I should look into in my new place. By using a sacrificial decoy eggplant, I could lure the beetles into walking on the sharp diatomaceous earth before flowering began, because as it turns out, diatomaceous earth potentially kills all kinds of insects, including bees. It was a cash 22. Plan F. To be or not to be. To prevent any potential aphid infestation carried by ants into the protected row cover tent, I sprinkled diatomaceous earth over the leaves. While that strategy worked and the plants looked stout, without bees pollinating them, no fruit was setting. I couldn't cover them to give access to the bees at the risk of them walking over the diatomaceous earth and dying. Or I could try to take matters into my own hands pollinating the plants with a soft brush. The plants look beautiful and they're, they're flowering profusely. However, can't get them to set. With little to no success in pollinating, and after witnessing fruit set in the old cottage garden since successfully dusting the pest away, I decided to uncover the plants and keep dusting them with diatomaceous earth. I figured that because the flowers hang down, the dust would not settle on them. Since bees usually only land directly on the petals, I felt that they would not be affected. As I hoped for the best, the garden clothed itself in the exuberant garb of high summer. A parade of blooms festooned the way, like jubilant townspeople cheering victorious homebound heroes lugging the spoils of war. Stage 5. Victory at last? The pockmarked eggplant leaves indicated the final battle waged by the resolute beetles, but unlike last year, the plant had grown large enough to store enough energy to weather through the attack. After so many failed attempts, I finally see a glimmer of hope. 
I have fruit set and the weather has been rather dry. All the diatomaceous earth that I've applied has actually stuck without being washed away by the rain and it has helped to fight the flea beetle population. An unusually long dry spell prompted me to water the plants by hose to help them finish their life's duty. As the beetle's population waned and with bees pollinating the flowers, at last I had decent fruit forming. Certainly, I had not fully extinguished the beetle threat. This new garden undoubtedly had large numbers of the critters, and it would take some time to get the populations in control through these organic means. But I had a viable strategy to follow from now on. After two years of abject failure, I can finally say that I have success with the eggplants. That's because I'm about to harvest some real amounts of fruit. I've had a fruit here and there, and I can't really say what I got last year was a harvest. It was one puny fruit. I'm glad that I took this more moderate approach, trying to observe first without overreacting, without spraying toxic chemicals everywhere, or even using other organic solutions that might not be as targeted to the flea beetles. The numbers have gone down and the plants were vigorous enough that they are actually producing. Not all of the plants are, weirdly enough, the ones that I put first have actually developed better. That's important. Try to start as soon as possible and then use a row cover and then use diatomaceous earth. Now this might not work for everyone because many times organic solutions are very local or hyper local. They have to do with the problems you're having in your garden. So that's why it's important to observe and then learn and then change. For now, I could celebrate by cooking up my prized veggies into a delicious and simple ratatouille. Sometimes the simplest recipes can best showcase the true flavor of fresh produce. First, I crushed a clove of garlic and reserved. Then I finely diced a red onion I had picked from the garden and cut the eggplant into small cubes. By cutting the veggies into small pieces, you can cook this dish in a few minutes, which is perfect for hot summer days. I also diced a long red sweet bell pepper and a cubanelle pepper and chopped some fresh parsley to impart herb flavor. A few chopped up kalamata olives would give tart savory complexity to the dish. In a skillet I poured a bit of olive oil and stir fried the garlic, onion and olive until golden. A pinch of black pepper, turmeric and cumin would season and color the dish. I added salt to taste and then dropped the eggplant and pepper, letting them caramelize a bit. I then finished by adding fresh parsley. As for the flea beetles, a saying comes to mind, whoever laughs last, laughs best. I may be laughing now, but only time will tell who laughs last. Let's taste it. Mmm. I already love eggplant, so obviously I'm biased. But this is so full of fresh, sweet flavor. I don't feel any bitterness from this eggplant. The struggle was worth it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I am working on additional episodes for the design series, and I hope you look forward to that. I want to thank everyone who has bought art to help me produce these videos, as well as my Patreons. If you want to help support new, high-quality videos, you can buy art from my Etsy shop. I've added several pieces recently, and I'm always adding more, so you might want to check it out. You can also become a Patreon. Thank you very much, and see you next time.